Hey there. Thanks for listening to the Greg Laurie Podcast, a ministry supported by Harvest Partners. I'm Greg Laurie, encouraging you. If you want to find out more about Harvest Ministries and learn more about how to become a Harvest Partner, just go to harvest.org. Well, everyone, the holidays are upon us officially, right? And this is the weekend before Thanksgiving, so I have a special Thanksgiving message for you, and the title of it is Thankful People Are Happy People. So before we talk about what the Bible says about giving thanks to the Lord in Acts chapter 16, why don't we give thanks in prayer? Father, we ask you to bless this time of Bible study. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us. We're so thankful for all that you're doing for us. And we're thankful for what is yet in our future. So speak to us from your word, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask this, amen. I don't know about you, but I love Thanksgiving. You know, Christmas, there's so much pressure attached to it and trying to find the right gift for the right person. But Thanksgiving is so great because it's a little more relaxed It's about getting together with family and with friends and, of course, eating. Uh, I asked my granddaughter Stella the other day what her favorite part of the holidays is, and she didn't pick Christmas. She picked Thanksgiving. I said, why? Just one word, food. She's a teenager. She doesn't say as much as she used to. Food. And I have to agree. Now, I don't know what you have in your home for Thanksgiving, but here's what our Thanksgiving food looks like, and here's some little videos that I shot uh, from last Thanksgiving. Now, I know that looks strange. That's the turkey before it's going into the oven. Here we have sweet potatoes and green beans with sliced almonds on top of them, and that's stuffing, cornbread stuffing, mashed potatoes, and of course gravy, and there's a turkey and some ham. Everything is better with gravy, but we can't forget the pumpkin pie. So those are some of the things we have in our home around the Thanksgiving time. Now, I don't know what your favorite part of the turkey is. Some people like the white meat, some people like the dark meat, some people like the drumstick, and of course there's only two. I did hear about an industrious turkey farmer that decided he could come up with a solution. So he managed to breed a special turkey that had six legs. One of his friends said, that's amazing. How did the meat taste? He said, I don't know. I could never catch the thing. But here's the problem. We all overeat on Thanksgiving, right? And then we say, I don't want to even see turkey again. But what happens? A little bit later, you're having a turkey sandwich, right? So there are telltale signs that you've had too much to eat on Thanksgiving Day. What are they? Number one, you know you've had too much to eat on Thanksgiving when your doctor tells you your weight would be perfect for a man who is 17 feet tall. You know you've had too much to eat on Thanksgiving when you are responsible for a slight but measurable shift in the earth's access. You know that you've had too much to eat for Thanksgiving when you decide to take a little nap and you wake up in (laughs) mid-July. You know you've had too much to eat for Thanksgiving when getting off the couch requires help from the fire department. Finally, you know you've had too much to eat for Thanksgiving when you're sweating gravy. Well, listen, Thanksgiving's a great time. It's a great celebration. But for the Christian, every day should be Thanksgiving, minus the turkey. We should always be giving thanks to the Lord because the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ concerning you. Now, sometimes that's easier than other times. It's easy to give thanks when a new baby is born. It's not as easy to give thanks when a loved one dies. It's easy to give thanks when things are going well. It's not as easy to give thanks when things are not going so well. It's one thing to give thanks when the bills are paid and the sky is blue and the sun is shining. It's another thing to give thanks when you're sick, you're facing financial troubles, and you have other challenges looming. But here's what the Bible says, that we should give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Notice that verse does not say give thanks to the Lord when you feel good. You see, you don't always feel good. I give thanks to the Lord because he is good. Now listen, if God ceases 
to be good, then I suppose you can stop giving thanks. But since he will never cease to be good, you should continue to give thanks to him. Paul writes in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. By the way, when Paul wrote those words, he was not kicking back on some beach eating a falafel. He was in a prison. And yet he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Think of poor Job. This is a man that literally lost everything that was dear to him, including his seven sons and his three daughters. It's really unimaginable what happened in a small space of time to the man called Job. Yet the Bible tells us that despite these horrific circumstances, Job gave thanks. Job 121 says, Job said to the Lord, naked came I into this world, naked will I leave. The Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. So it comes down to this, we need an attitude of gratitude. Not just because the Bible tells us we should have it, but here's another reason why you want to give thanks to the Lord, because thankful people are happy people. <laughs> there have been a lot of studies that have been done on this topic. Research shows that grateful people actually have fewer aches and pains than non-grateful people. They also report feeling healthier than other people. One expert said, and I quote, the expression of gratitude is a kind of meta strategy for achieving happiness. Isn't that interesting? Robert Emmons, a PhD and leading gratitude researcher, I didn't even know they existed, but this is what he does. He said this quote, gratitude reduces toxic emotions ranging from envy and frustration and reduces depression and actually increases happiness. I mean, gratitude can actually change your very mood. You can just start by smiling. Did you know it takes 17 muscles to smile, but it takes 43 muscles to frown? So it's less work and it's better for you. Just smile. You say, well, I don't feel like smiling, but the idea is I develop an attitude of gratitude if I feel like it or not. And we have so much to be thankful for. Really, it comes down to this. We discover why we exist. The two most important moments in a person's life is when they are born and then when they realize what they're born for. Let me tell you what you're born for. You are born, you're here in this earth to bring glory to God. And when you seek to glorify God with your life and your actions and your words and your decisions, uh, you are fulfilling the purpose that God created you for. The Bible says in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You might say, well, Greg, what if I'm not feeling it? What if my heart's not in it? Do you think Job felt like giving praise to God after such tremendous loss? I doubt he did, but he offered what the Bible calls a sacrifice of praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, let's offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. See, it's really important to verbalize your praise, not just think it, not even just feel it, actually verbalize it, and sometimes that's a sacrifice. Take marriage as an example. Maybe there's a husband that just loves his wife so much, but he never tells her he loves her. He never compliments her. He never verbalizes his love toward her. He needs to start doing it, and the wife needs to do it for the husband as well. But in the case of our relationship with God, we should verbalize our praise. Oh, sure, God knows we love him, but he wants to hear it from us. Again, as that verse says, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. See, far too often we fail to give God the glory that is due to his name. Psalm 29, 2 says, give thanks unto the Lord and bring the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So often we ask God for things. We pray for his intervention. He graciously answers. 
He, he does that thing we ask him to do. Maybe he even does above and beyond that thing we asked him to do. And then what do we do? We just move on. Thanks, God. See you next crisis. Have you ever just stopped to say, Lord, thank you for answering that prayer. I prayed for your provision, and it came. I prayed for that healing, and you gave it. I prayed for this person's life to turn around, and it did. Lord, I want to thank you for that. The Bible tells the story of 10 lepers who came to Jesus asking for healing. Leprosy was incurable. These men were the outcasts of society. Jesus touches them and heals them. And then we read that only one came back to give thanks for the healing. And Jesus asked this poignant question, where are the other nine? And it's interesting that one that came back really offered great thanks to the Lord. In fact, the phrase that is used in the scripture is he fell down on his face and gave thanks and said it loudly and it comes from a root word that's translated to megaphone. This guy let the Lord know he was thankful for being healed of leprosy. When's the last time you let the Lord know you're thankful for what he has done for you? All right, so here's some takeaway principles about giving thanks. If you're taking notes, here's point number one. To give thanks, I must first realize that God is in control of my life. Let me say that again. To give thanks, I must first realize that God is in control of my life. Now, look, we make our plans, but God will have his way. We are not in control of our lives, though we think we are sometimes. He is. And uh, that comes as a revelation to some people. Proverbs 16, 9 says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, I know, Lord, that a person's life is not his own. No one is able to plan his own course. And that's true. God is sovereign. And when we say God is sovereign, it means that God is in control. Listen, God is able to do what he pleases with whomever he chooses, whenever he wishes. Psalm 115, verse 3 says, our God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases. So listen, even when bad things happen, God is ultimately in control. God either did it or God has allowed it in our life. And when he's allowed it, we know ultimately God can bring good despite the bad because Romans eight twenty eight says we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Number two, I must realize that God loves me and is always looking out for my eternal benefit. So again, number one was to give thanks, I must realize that God's in control of my life. But I can misunderstand that and think of God as harsh and angry and austere. But let's remember the second point I brought up, he loves me and he's looking out for my eternal benefit, even if what I am going through in the moment is difficult. Listen to this passage from 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul writes, our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurable great glory that will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we see right now, rather we look forward to what we have not yet seen for the troubles we've seen now will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. A perfect illustration of this is a biscuit. <laughs> You're saying a biscuit? Oh yeah. I don't know if you love biscuits. I love them so much. And uh, I was spending part of my childhood with my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother and my grandfather, Stella and Charles McDaniel. They were from Arkansas, so we called them Mama Stella and Daddy Charles. And, and my grandmother made everything from scratch. She never served leftovers. And so we had a lot of that great Southern cooking, you know, fried chicken, of course, black-eyed peas, okra, collard greens, fresh mashed potatoes. But the crowning achievement of what my grandmother made was the biscuit. And as my grandmother was getting older, I had my wife, Kathy, uh, watch Mama Stella make the biscuit. I said, Kathy, watch Mama Stella. We can't let this recipe 
die with her. We need to be able to carry it on. So Kathy would watch Mama Stella make the biscuit and it seemed so simple because what did she use? She used vegetable oil. She used self-rising flour and buttermilk. Now, none of those things are appealing in and of themselves. You don't have a glass of vegetable oil. Some people like to drink buttermilk. I don't. But uh, put them together in expert hands. And that's what Mama Stella did. She mixed them in a certain way. She had a certain finesse. And then she put them into a very hot oven. And we all agreed, this is very good. So in the same way in our lives, God takes the event of our lives, the good things, the so-called bad things, he puts them in the oven of adversity. And ultimately we say, this is good. See, God's in control, and he loves us. And third point, to give thanks, I must realize that God is far wiser than I am. I'm always thinking of my temporal good. God is always thinking of my eternal good. And sometimes what immediately good is not always eternally good, but what is eternally good is not always immediately good, and sometimes it's painful. It's like going to the dentist. Does anyone like to go to the dentist? I, so I have not met them. I think we all have a sense of dread. I, I just went to my dentist for a cleaning and they're always looking for trouble, you know, and, and maybe the person is cleaning away and then she'll say, a doctor, could you come and take a look at this? I'm like, oh no, oh no, what now? But uh, maybe they'll find that you have a cavity and you need a filling. Or maybe one of your crowns is broken and they need to replace it. And even worse, maybe you need a root canal. None of these things are appealing, but they're far better than the alternative, right? So they do those things for your good. And sometimes there are things happening in our life that we're not enjoying, but they're far better than the alternative. God is at work, working all things together for his glory and for your good. All right, so... Let's look at Acts chapter 16. This is a a powerful story of two men, Paul and Silas. Remember, last time we saw how Saul of Tarsus came to Christ on the road to Damascus and ultimately becomes the great apostle Paul. So we're looking at how Paul and Silas, who had been preaching the gospel, reacted when they went through a time of suffering how they were able to praise the Lord. Starting with verse 23 from the New Living Translation. They were severely beaten. This would be Paul and Silas. And they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. And he took no chances and put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet into the stocks. And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its very foundations, and all the doors flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up. He could see that the prison doors were wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Paul shouts to him, don't do it, we're still here, trembling with fear. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved along with you and your entire household. Then they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. And the same hour the jailer washed their wounds and he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. And then he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he he and his entire household believed because of what God had done. Powerful story, isn't it? So let's think about what happened. Here are Paul and Silas who are thrown into a prison. And next thing you know, they're leading the jailer to the Lord. How did this all come about? Simple answer. It came about because Paul and Silas gave thanks despite their circumstances. They didn't wait for the deliverance. They didn't give thanks after they got out of prison. They gave thanks when they were in prison. And notice they took them into the inner part of the prison and their legs were in chains. This was like a dungeon. 
This was a hellhole. This was a horrible place to be, which makes it even more remarkable that they were able to give praise to God. You know, the midnight hour is not the easiest time to give thanks to God, but I love how Paul and Silas brought their songs in the night. Psalm 42 verse 8 says, Through each night the Lord pours His unfailing love upon me, and through each night I sing His songs, praying to God who gives me life. Have you ever woke up in the middle of the night, like three in the morning, and your troubles and your worries encroach upon you? They close in on you like a vice. Your mind is flooded with anxiety. This is where the Bible says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And the peace of God that passes all human understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So here's Paul and Silas in prison. They start singing praises to God. Were they doing a little two-part harmony? You know, Everly Brothers, Lennon McCartney? I don't know. But I don't think they'd ever heard anyone sing in that prison before. And it's interesting because we read in uh, verse 25, the other prisoners were listening to them. It doesn't just mean they were listening. It could be translated, they were listening with pleasure. You know, in this world that we're living in, when a Christian can bring praise and glory to God, that is a powerful testimony. Non-believers would love to write us all off as a bunch of nuts. Christians are crazy. They're fanatical. They're out of touch with reality, they will say of us. But when they see a Christian going through a time of suffering, maybe facing a cancer diagnosis, maybe dealing with the death of a loved one, maybe dealing with some other difficulty, and they see that our faith is intact and we're giving praise to God. Listen, that is a powerful testimony. You can be sure that Roman jailer was paying attention and he was being moved by what he was hearing. It was actually seeing Christians worship that initially got my attention. I uh, was raised in Southern California in an area called Newport Beach. I went to a high school called Corona Del Mar High School. And I transferred to another high school called Harbor High School. Now, when I was at Corona Del Mar High, I was kind of into the party scene, hanging around with football players, going out on the weekends and drinking, etc. And the whole drug culture was coming along, and I decided I wanted to become a different person. I didn't want to be the person I was, the partying, drinking guy. I thought, I think drugs have the answer. I think I will discover what life is all about by using drugs. And I transferred to this other school called Harbor High School with the intention of being a different person than I was. And that's exactly what happened, but not in the way I expected. When I enrolled and I was now uh, going to that school, some of my friends that I knew said, Greg, be really careful. There's a lot of Jesus freaks here at Harbor High. I said, what do you mean? All the, these very out front, overt Christians that carry Bibles around and talk about Jesus. And I remember saying to my friend, the last thing I'll ever become is a Jesus freak. Don't worry about me. And sure enough, there were the Jesus freaks. They would march through the campus singing songs. Sometimes we'd throw our food at them. We'd laugh at them. What a bunch of morons. But then I saw this cute girl one day talking to a friend of mine. And I thought, whoa, look at that cute girl. I think I'll step up there and maybe enter into the conversation when there's a break. And as I'm waiting, I notice she has a, her notebook for her class. She has a couple of textbooks. And then I noticed she had a book like this with gold pages and ribbons. I thought, oh, no, she's a Jesus freak. And then I thought, what a waste of a perfectly cute girl. But then I thought, but why would she be a Jesus freak? So fast forward a day or so, I'm walking across the campus, kind of looking for this girl. Where is she? And I find her sitting in a circle of Christians on the front lawn of the campus at lunchtime, singing songs about God. And I sat at a distance so I could kind of eavesdrop on what they were doing, but not so close that people would think I was becoming one of them. And as I watched them sing these songs about the Lord, Simple choruses, three chords, G, C, D, maybe E minor, that's it. But as I watched them, I thought, they do seem to be happy people. 
They do seem to have something that's real. And I knew for a fact they didn't use drugs because one of the guys there, his name was Bill, used to be a buddy I partied with, and now he's a Jesus freak. So it messed with my narrative. I wanted to write them off as crazy people, but this guy was a normal guy. And I'm thinking, he's one of them, and that girl's one of them. And it opened my heart up. And then I heard the gospel for the first time, and that's the day I became a Christian. But my point is, their worship of God was something that moved me. And I think when we can worship God, it is a powerful testimony to a lost world. And that's what was happening here with Paul and Silas. But here's another good thing about worship. It's something that God has given to us as a gift. It's something we're gonna be doing a lot of when we get to heaven. So get in practice. Because we read in Revelation 5.12, they sang in a mighty chorus, the Lamb is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Hey, let's be honest. Christians have the best music. And that's because we have something to sing about. Take Easter, take Christmas as an example. We have the best songs. Oh, there's a lot of good songs I like around Christmas time, but the best songs are those great songs that have stood the test of time. Hark the herald angels sing, silent night, joy to the world. Even non-believers listen to and appreciate these songs because we have a God that is worth singing to. But here's a great thing about worship. It can put your problems into perspective. You know, you can be overwhelmed by what you're facing. And maybe I'm talking to somebody right now that is facing great difficulties. But when you take time to pray and you take time to worship, you get a different view of what you're going through. You're seeing God in his glory, God in his greatness, and thus you're seeing your problems or your challenges and their relative smallness. I'm not saying you don't have big problems. But I'm simply saying your God is bigger. And this is why the Bible says, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Magnify. See God in his greatness. So that's exactly what they were doing. So in the Old Testament, Asaph was grappling with the age-old question, why do the wicked prosper? Have you ever wondered that? Well, why do non-believers get away with what they get away with? And he says in Psalm 73, 16, when I tried to figure this out, this is from a modern translation, when I tried to figure this out, it gave me a splitting headache <laughs> until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I saw the whole picture. He writes, I didn't understand why things are the way they are until I came into God's presence to study his word. Then my questions came into a proper perspective. And that's so true, isn't it? Haven't you found that? You know, you're really feeling down and then you open the word of God or you sing a praise song and suddenly you see things a little differently. You're filled with anxiety, but you pray and you commit it to the Lord and that pressure is lifted from you. That's what Paul and Silas are doing. They're praising the Lord. They're giving glory to God. And that's because their contentment and joy did not come from what they have. It came from who they knew. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You have to get things in perspective and that's exactly what they did. I want you to notice also, they did not pray for deliverance. They just praise the Lord. Verse 25 says, as they were singing, the others were listening. They didn't pray for a way out. They just gave glory to God. Now, of course, an earthquake came, and they were ultimately delivered, but did they know an earthquake was coming? I don't know that they did. They just rejoiced in the Lord despite their circumstances, because sometimes, frankly, the earthquake does not come. The healing does not come. The thing you were hoping for does not happen, but God is still with you in your time of adversity. Uh, sometimes he de delivers us from our circumstances, like Daniel in the lion's den, but he still spent a night 
or the lions, didn't he? And sometimes he delivers us in our circumstances like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the bottom line is God is with you wherever you are. So give thanks to him. Not just, not just because Thanksgiving is coming. Give thanks to him because he is good and he is worthy of your praise and it will help you get perspective and it will change your mood. Well, the earthquake did come in this instance and the prison guard thought, I'm dead. Because <laughs> if you're a guard in charge of two very important people like Paul and Silas and you're told to make sure they don't escape, you will be executed for failing to do your duty. He's literally pulling out his sword, ready to kill himself, and Paul interrupts him and says, don't kill yourself, we're all still here. And notice that this man immediately says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Just as Saul of Tarsus was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, causing him to lash out at the Christians, hunting them down and bringing them back to Jerusalem in chains. This man was under the conviction of the Spirit as well. And by the way, he was a hard man. Paul used to be a hard man too. I think Saul, now Paul, had a particular compassion for this Roman guard. Like, man, I used to be you. I know what it's like to be cruel like you are. How you whipped us and treated us so badly, even worse than you would treat a normal prisoner. I know what that's like, but I know how God changed me. And now when this man says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul could have said, man, I hope you get judged for the way you treated us. My back still hurts from that whip. No, but Paul and Silas graciously offer this man hope, and they tell him to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will be saved. Listen, whatever you're going through right now, give thanks to the Lord. Not because you feel good, but because he is good. Don't give thanks because things are going well. Give thanks because God is on the throne. Let me close with what the jailer said to Paul and Silas. He said, sirs, notice the politeness there. Sirs, what must I do to be saved. And look at Paul's answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Are you saved? I like that word saved. Um, because it really is very descriptive. How would we use the word saved? Well, we might read it in an article. A firefighter went into a burning building and saved a person. Or someone's drowning and the lifeguard saved them. That's exactly what they did. And we need to be saved because we are in something worse than a burning building. We need to be saved because we're in a worse situation than someone who is drowning. We are facing the penalty for our sin and God can save you. How? The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This man, this jailer, he believed and his family believed. And everyone came to faith because of the powerful testimony of Paul and Silas giving thanks to God in difficult circumstances. Maybe I'm talking to someone right now that wants to be saved. You want to be confident that when you die, you will go to heaven. That can happen for you right here, right now. Just as surely as God saved this man some 2,000 years ago, he can save you. He can forgive you. He can give you the hope of life beyond the grave and the presence of God and then a relationship with the Lord that you can have right here, right now. Listen, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sin. He did that voluntarily because he knew there was no other way that you could be in a relationship with this holy God that we have all offended through our sin. You say, but Greg, I haven't sinned that much. Well, God doesn't grade on the curve. One sin is enough to keep you out of heaven. The Bible says if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. But listen, Christ died for your sins. And if you'll turn from your sin and ask him to come into your life to be your Savior and Lord, you can be saved. Would you like to come into this relationship with God? Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Would you like to be saved? 
If so, I'm gonna pray a simple prayer. I would ask that you would pray this prayer with me. You can pray it out loud if you like. You can pray it in the quietness of your heart. But God will hear as you call out to him. Remember again, the Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what you're doing right now in prayer. You're calling on the name of the Lord. So if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, if you want to be saved, pray this after me now. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I turn now from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior and Lord, as my God and friend. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to this podcast. To learn more about Harvest Ministries, follow this show and consider supporting it. Just go to harvest.org. And to find out how to know God personally, go to harvest.org and click on Know God.